Good evening and welcome to Legal Tech Live. I'm your host, Nick Rishwain. Our guest tonight is Stephen Kane. Stephen is the founder and CEO of Fair Claims. You can find them at fairclaims.com. This is an online arbitration, online dispute resolution solution. Uh, I, I'm not going to try and say that three times fast, Stephen, because uh, I, I just realized how, how easily that happened the first time. Stephen, welcome to the show. You've been doing fair claims for uh, four or five years now, correct? Is that about how long you've been doing this? That's about right. By the way, thank you. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Uh, full time for about five years. About you know, five years. Part, okay. Part time a couple years before that, but yeah. All right. So right. take me back to you. You practiced. You were a practicing attorney. Uh, when did you have? Take me to the ideation stage, if you will. Sure. Well, I think it started as a thought in the back of my head a few times. Once was in law school, right? And okay. we read about online dispute resolution. At the, si at the time, it seemed impractical to me. Um, I, I couldn't imagine. Part of it, I think, was because of what I had seen on TV and in the movies, right? I couldn't imagine people doing things in such an informal manner, right? Online and, and uh, remote, uh, so different than the images we've seen. Than we've seen, that we right. grew up with, yeah. Yeah, so I'd say that was the first kernel. And then, and then as I was practicing, I went to a big firm out of law school and I worked at a few different legal tech companies. And as I was practicing, then I, I saw a need for maybe some sort of online settlement solution because it always seemed like a silly game of chicken. Uh, mm -hmm. both, you know, the attorneys kind of knew they wanted to settle, kind of knew what they wanted to settle at, but would play games. I, I heard somebody I met recently who said that uh, litigation is funny because once litigation starts, the, the underlying substantive legal issue goes away and you're playing a totally different game. It's, you may as well be playing hockey to determine who wins. It's so different than the underlying issue. I have to agree with it. You know, I think that's right. <laughs> you know, and this is, this is somebody who went to law school, but is a business person. I think that's right. And so anyway, it, it, a couple of times in, in between, it popped in my head as, you know, maybe there could be some online settlement tool that makes sense. And then when I had my own clients, that's when I really hit home. I kept getting calls from people with small claims disputes they couldn't or didn't want to do anything with or were intimidated to do something with. Didn't think about how much money I cost to help them, just needed help, didn't want to do it themselves, didn't have the time to take off work, go through the figure out the small claims rules and the red tape and all that. So that's kind of how it, it all came about. Okay. All right. And uh... You, you focused on small claims, but you guys do more than just small claims, right? You do a, a wider variety of ODR. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. We started it, with just small claims, but now gotcha. it's expanded. Uh -huh. Okay. And and we'll get to more about what exactly the company does, but I want, so, so you had this idea, you're practicing. Uh, when did you start building the company? And and was it... Uh, I'm practicing during the day and I'm, and I'm building at night or how's that, how did that work out? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So about seven and a half years ago is when I first started uh, talking to people about the concept and I spent six months incubating it. And I read a book that said, if you do what you love first thing in the morning, that'll fill your day with energy that, that a lot of people that it's counterintuitive to some people it was to me that a lot of people, uh, especially type A's, <laughs> Uh, get their to-do list done first and then do the thing they enjoy. This yeah. Book. Yeah. Right. I mean, a that's lot of people, how I would have thought. Yeah. Right. That's how I thought too. get it out of the way. This book said, st start with what you love, do that even for 20 minutes, first thing in the morning. And you'll see that you want to do it more and more and you want to spend more and more time on it. And eventually it'll become your full-time job. And that's kind of what happened. So I was practicing law, but started doing this on the side. Interesting. Okay. That's uh, and that's an, I, I may have to try this tactic actually to see how this, how this works out. Cause I'm up real, I'm up really early every day. I want to thank Brian, uh, Brian Saunders and Mitch Jackson for joining us here in the zoom room. Uh, looking for those who are watching over in the Facebook chat. If you got questions for Steven, please uh, don't be afraid to ask. So Hi, Brian. Hi, Mitch. Yep. And how do you, uh, so when did you finally go, decide to go full-time? Now I'm going to leave the the safety of a big law, big law career, and I'm going to go out on the startup path. 
Yeah, well, um, and actually, um, by the time it was time for me to be full time, I had my own legal clients. And okay. I, you know, I had my own practice. And so that made it a little bit easier to adjust my schedule as need be, right? And, um, and so it kind of evolved slowly over time. There wasn't like one moment, but we raised venture capital funding and that helped me go full time. Okay. Uh, but we were making revenue ahead of that. And I had a small team and, st- and raised a little bit of money ahead of that, right? And had a small team. So it kind of just like naturally evolved and ramped. Okay. All right. So then let's take it. You're a non-technical founder, right? Yep. Yep. So how did you handle that issue? Uh, You had the idea, you'd heard about ODR, you'd studied it, you'd been playing around with it. You're you're working on it a little bit in the mornings. Uh, How did you, all right, now how do I actually build the technology that I need? Sure. Well, I started off by doing everything manually right? Just to test it out, get a sense of things, right? And uh, was making revenue before we had a tech platform and was doing everything manually on the back end using a Squarespace site. So we made it look Uh like it was automated, but it was all manual. (laughs) First, it was me doing it manually for a few months. Then I met somebody else who I paid some money to do it manually. And then someone else. So a few of us took turns. Um, That's how we first started. In terms of like finding a technical co-founder, I tested a couple different people out. So uh, some of my friends who had done startups advised me that it, that's obviously a key relationship and you should uh, set expectations and do trial runs with, with people until you find the right person. So I did that. Um, and the first person was great, but um, it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't for them. They had other things going that they mm-hmm. were interested in, right? It happened once or twice. And I met my co-founder, my technical co-founder on AngelList. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and when you brought them on, you started to build it out at that point. Or yeah. They started to build it out. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for our for our viewers, and I see there's some folks over in the Facebook group now, and, and uh, as well as Brian and Mitch here, tell us, take us through how does fair claims work? I'm, I'm a user. I've, I've got a case. What do I do? Sure. So the way it works is uh, both sides need to sign up. They're either, either, you know, it's arbitration, right? It's mainly online arbitration or mediation. So both sides have to agree either uh, pre-dispute in a contract or in the terms of service or post-dispute, right? But the way that it technically works is the claimant gets a unique sign-up link. Okay. They go to a, a page to sign up. We, we work very hard not to hide the eight ball of what they're getting themselves into, right? So we, we're very clear and transparent about it. here's what you're agreeing to. You, you can't go to court. You know, this is l- legally binding, et cetera. And they sign up voluntarily to arbitrate. Then the respondent does the same. Once they both get signed up, we assign an arbitrator who for small claims is an attorney with at least 10 years experience and a whole lot of EQ and but backbone and um, you know, diligent about their job, right? And at this point, they've had hundreds or thousands of arbitrations on the platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it's a professional arbitrator. If it's above $25,000, we have a, a product for that too. But either way, the arbitrator gets assigned. Then both sides uh, pick a hearing date. You know, I'm talking about for small claims mainly. And then uh, they can upload evidence, have a half hour audio hearing. We started with video, but people prefer audio for different reasons. Mm-hmm. And then get their decision within a few days after that. So the whole process is like three weeks. Now, do both parties have to, they both have to agree to, to participate in this, correct? Yeah, exactly. Either okay. they're pre-dispute or post-dispute in a contract or, or after the dispute on our website. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and you said in a contract, are, are you, is there specific types of cases that you're handling right now? We can handle any monetary dispute, but we mainly, uh, our bread and butter is construction, re- so residential construction disputes and, okay. uh, and auto, auto damage disputes. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and are you available in all 50 states right now? Or are you available in California? How's that work? Yeah, all 50 states. One of our first cases was in Hawaii. No kidding. Yeah, uh, yeah. All right. We had to change the time zone settings on the platform because we weren't ready for you know, <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. So did you roll it out uh, to all 50 states from, from the beginning or did you roll out uh, jurisdictionally? 
We rolled out to all 50 states from the beginning because we work through share and economy marketplace partners. Okay. Who uh, have been the major feeder of the volume of our disputes. So tell me about that. What is that group? Sure. You know, so I spent six months incubating the idea, and then I spent a year looking for somebody to pay me money to use the to use arbitration for small claims, right? Right. Uh, the people who were, were most responsive were sharing economy marketplace execs. So um, our first two customers were Thumbtack and Turo. Uh, now Home Advisor and Angie's List. Now they've merged to be called Angie. Um, and Outdoorsy and Get Around and a bunch of other these sharing economy marketplaces also work with us. And, you know, what's, what's interesting about them is they sit in the middle of two parties who have a dispute or one of their users might have a dispute against them. They, you know, they're, they're a maturing industry. Certainly when we started working with them six years ago, they were like an earlier stage industry that was more open to new ideas, mm -hmm. startup friendly, more, more techie wanted things to be online and remote at uh, pre-COVID when less people were open-minded to mm -hmm. um, dispute resolution. And um, so they feed us, they feed us a lot of the disputes for small claims. Interesting. Uh, they, and what a fascinating uh, uh, way for you to get, uh, get the users in the door. That, yeah. that is uh, so interesting that you took six months uh, to do that. So you saw it as, all right, I've built this but trying to gather a large variety of consumers to come use this is going to be difficult. Is, right. that, is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So how did you target these sharing economy uh, services and say, this is what I'm offering and uh, how can we get you to use our service? At first it was cold emailing and, okay. um, you know, but that was, um, I was testing a bunch of different industries. I, I cold emailed dry cleaners. I cold emailed, you know, real estate agents. I cold emailed landlords, right? Property managers, all the, and uh, they were, they were one of many different industries I was testing out with the sharing economy marketplaces right from the beginning. I heard back from about 30% of them pretty quickly. So that's when I knew there was, there was something there. So it, was, it started off with cold emails and phone calls and then in-person meetings. And then I st we started having events with different marketplace execs. Then we joined a trade group, right? And that's how we that's how we got going. That's fantastic. And yeah. so you you had traction. Uh, you're offering the service to sharing economy uh, industry and mm -hmm. and uh, marketplaces. And when did you did did you raise? Uh, before this happened, or did you have, you had some traction before you raised, it sounded like? We raised most of our money after we had traction. We raised a little bit of angel financing when we were just still, I was still testing things out, you know, like 50 grand. Um, yeah. Okay. So what, did you already have these marketplaces uh, on uh, as, as users, as customers, when you went to raise uh, additional, and and Stephen told me before we got started, it, and I didn't tell him that I like to come into these interviews blind, so I do very little research because it allows me to have a greater conversation. I forgot to tell you that, Stephen. So now you no, know. That's perfect. Beautiful. Yeah, uh, but he told me before we started that he had, you've raised uh, about four point three million dollars in venture right. funding. Right. And so you had, did you have some of these like Thumbtack uh, marketplaces and so forth when you went to raise? Oh yeah. Yeah. We had them as customers and we were growing at the classic, you know, 20% a month. And uh, when we raised our, our, the bulk of our venture funding. Is that, cause that's an impressive, that's, you know, that's impressive contracts to be able to share with people that yeah, sure. we're servicing these companies already. Um, sure. Tell us how you went about raising. Uh, you know, it's early, it's early in in the discussion for when we do this. But uh, many of our founders who who watch in the legal tech community on Facebook and and listen, you know, this is this is always a difficult area for for new startups. How did you go about the raise? Did you do? And Mitch is saying in the uh, in the Facebook group, great hustle on the cold emails. Uh, oh, thanks, Mitch. And, yeah. and 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 wondering if you did the cold emails to, to, uh, to fundraise similar that, as you did with, uh, with uh, getting the customers. 
I did do cold emails to fundraise. The the more uh, I was more successful through introductions, but we don't all have that luxury, and you can't get an introduction to every investor. I got told no by pretty much every VC in LA. So okay. uh, at the time, there were the LA VC scene was was burgeoning. I mean, I think now there's a lot more. You know, there's mm. a lot more money here. At the time, it was it was decent. It was you know getting going. And uh, I definitely got turned down by everybody. Some of those were cold emails uh, for meetings. I didn't get um, many, many replies on those. It was, it was hustling through introductions. And that's easier for some people than others. That's a big problem in the tech industry, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, there's, 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 um, there's some nasty gates that keep a lot of people out, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so I was fortunate to know people who had raised money for startups or in the tech scene or even investors in, 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 in the industry. And so that was helpful. Without that, it would have been even more difficult, but I would have, I think uh, I've seen other people find intros to people who can make intros to people who can make intros to people, right? So right. just need a few more steps. Um, but the intros were, were more helpful than, than not. I got turned down by just about everybody. Uh, getting some key uh, angel investors in place was helpful. You know, like, so Brian Liu, one of the founders of LegalZoom, mm-hmm. asked it right before we raised our venture round. And the biggest question from everybody at the time, because they, they're just, they, they, they didn't know much about legal tech was, well, what is, what do the LegalZoom guys think about this? So it was mm-hmm. nice to, be able to answer that question, right? <laughs> With Yeah. Well, here's what they think that, you know, but it was hard, man. I, it was the hardest thing I ever did. I, what I had to learn to do, because I, I approached fundraising like sales, right? I thought, mm-hmm. well, problem solution, or you, you want to invest in a business that has merit, and this is a business that has merit. And so let me explain to you what this business is. Not the case, right? I had to be a lot more like this. I had to, right. I had to because I was approaching it as, as too much of a nice guy trying to make a connection, make a sale, build a relationship. It's not like that. Um, you have to act like you're the next Uber or Facebook or you don't get their attention. That's fan- That's that's good information. I, I've heard that there, it's almost like a confidence game in certain respects, right? It's a total con game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you know, you don't want to be on the like illegal, immoral side of it, but it is a con but it's, game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, I'm, I have to promote what I'm doing. You know, that's why I tell people ahead of time, it's okay to promote your company on this show. That's what it's about. We're pro right. founder here. Um, yeah, you know, it's a confidence game in the classic sense of the word, which is that you're exuding confidence that, that you don't have the right to have because you haven't actually done anything yet. <laughs> well, right. That's fascinating, but that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, this is what I'm. This is what I'm capable of doing, and why you should get yeah. it. But but not knowing, right? Because you're trying to prove you can get acquired for thirty million dollars or more, or go public. I mean, you're you're trying to prove you might be able to be a public company, and worst case, you might be able to get acquired despite the odds. Everyone knows that most startups fail, most right. don't get acquired, all that. But yeah, that's what. So that's what I mean when when it's like you're trying to be something you're not. It's right. True. Yeah, it's true. And here I am. I practiced law, and yeah. but I've never done this before. And now I got to pretend I, that I'm totally capable. It's in it, it, and you probably are capable, but at showing that is is a, a difficult uh, difficult uh, approach or a difficult difficult thing to do. Um, it is. It is especially if you're a nice person. Mm-hmm. But you have to get outside of that if you want to raise venture funding. Although I don't think venture funding's for everybody. Yeah, not for everybody. Uh, so, so that uh, so you had bootstrapped. You had some angel. You went and you raised. You've raised raised a Series A now. Uh, we seed? raised we raised two Series Cs. Series Cs, okay. Yeah. We raised so four point three million total. Uh, one of the rounds was like one point eight million. Another round was nine hundred thousand. We had a few other big checks of three hundred thousand. So it's because we we haven't had a straight line of success. It's been, it's been up and down. So tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we tried working with insurance carriers for a couple of years. It didn't go well. Okay. We built a, we built a product to DIY your own insurance claim, auto accident, slip and fall. And 
Um, so it tested amazingly well. We ended up doing pilots with about seven or eight different insurance carriers, uh, but they take so long to do anything and they're so difficult to work with. Um, it was a success because we, in, or it looked like it was going to be a success because we got a two-year contract with uh, one of the major carriers, like mm -hmm. the number one general liability carrier. Um, but it didn't, it didn't go as planned. I mean, it was looking good. It was going up. We had pilots that were about to start with these other major insurance carriers. And we spent a couple of years doing it because everything just took so long. And, um, and again, yeah, they're just, they have a lot of requirements. So for a small startup, that's difficult. And, um, and they're just hard to work with. And so I, I decided to place a huge bet because I thought if we were successful, it's such a massive market, you know, worth 30, 30 plus billion dollars, such a massive market, such a big uh, strategic uh, advantage to be able to work with these carriers. And because things were, the product was great. Like um, instead of it taking months for somebody to settle an auto accident claim, it was taking them like a couple of days. Mm. You know, and, the, and, the, and the, the consumer was handling their own claim themselves without an attorney. So instead of giving the 30 to 40 percent to some of these TV and billboard attorneys, um, they were doing it themselves. And those, you know, the TV and billboard attorneys, what do they do? They send them to doctor appointments that a lot of them don't need to go on. And I've heard horror stories of people ending up worse because of it, et cetera, et cetera. So we were doing good. The product was working great. It would look like we were on the right path. It just didn't pan out. Mm. Interesting. Yep. And I wanted I want to go back one one step. I, I forgot to ask you about you said you didn't get any of the venture funding out of L.A. Where did you end up getting it? Oh, we did. We did raise uh, we did raise venture funding out of L.A. So we there got go. turned down by everybody. But then we got a couple of advisors who really knew what they were doing. They, they changed the game for us. Stuff that was counterintuitive to me. They they taught they taught us right like how to like how to put together our pitch deck. So for example, uh, when we put together our pitch deck to fundraise, our site didn't look that great. Our, our product didn't look that great, right? So they told us to go have a designer sketch out what the product will look like. And I thought, what, is, what difference does that make? Who cares about that? Turns out that it makes a difference, a huge difference, right? So right. I didn't think it would. That's a tangible example of something that made a big difference that they told us to do. The other thing they told us to do was to change our name. So our name was Arba Claims, mm -hmm. and I, I knew it wasn't the best name. It was just the best name I could think of at the time. Uh, but they said, change your name, change your name. So we decided on Fair Claims. Well, when we changed our name, the VCs who had passed on us or written us off or heard we weren't worth talking to decided to take another look. <laughs> so for some reason. Wow. Uh, so, so anyway, we raised from, from Fika Ventures, which is LA-based. They led our round. Then we got Crosslink, which is out of San Francisco, and then Graycroft, which is LA based. All right. Point eight million dollar round. Okay. All right. That's oh. great. Uh, tell us when. How do you? And Mitch says perception is everything, or almost everything. Oh, I've learned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us about. Uh, tell us about when when I'm a user and I come to your site, uh, and I want to have this this done. How do you get the arbitrators, uh, the mediators, or whomever on the back end? Uh, where do you where do you source these folks from, and how do you vet them? We vet them very carefully. We only accept about seven percent of anybody who ever applies with us. We're looking for very specific things, at least so for small claims, even so for 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 claims above twenty five thousand, those are professional arbitrators. We vet them very carefully too. We've turned down former judges because they didn't perform well in our mock arbitration and, and decision for whatever reason. Um, I think there's, there may be reasons, but anyway, for the small claims arbitrators, even though uh, they have to have at least 10 years experience as an attorney, we look for people with practical experience, you know, mm -hmm. they've, they've seen things in law, right? They've had clients, right? Uh, they have to have high EQ, which we kind of, that's qualitative, but we try to get a sense of who they are. Do they understand people? Do they enjoy resolving disputes what's their motivation are they fair-minded they have to have backbone to control the room if things get out of hand they have to be diligent show up on time right mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that um but uh and then a lot of them now have have handled hundreds or thousands of arbitrations and have a lot of experience but 
we have no problem um, getting applicants. A lot of attorneys want to do the job. Um, you know, I think like every lawyer wants to be a judge, right? So they, they kind of love it. Uh, it's like nov a novel area of law for them. It's something different. It supplements their income. They view it as a service to the community too, kind of helping people. Excellent. And then they do do these, uh, the arbitrations or are all done. These are in person. Uh, no, these are all online and, and online. Remote. So yeah. when you say control the room, they're controlling it virtual from, room. Yeah. Virtual room. And in okay. fact, we do, we do audio instead of video. We started doing video, but a lot of users were uncomfortable with that, at least pre COVID. But even now, a lot of them didn't want to be, um, didn't want to be seen. Didn't want to be seen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mitch uh, never wanted to be a judge, but Brian's got a question here and we'll step back one, one second. Uh, and, and it's a good question. What was the ultimate reason to stop working with auto insurance carriers? You just couldn't put the, couldn't pour the resource towards them or were these paid pilots with them? What was, what was the revenue model there? And, and what was the kind of ultimate reason to, to term, or to end that? Yeah, the, it was a great product that had value prop for the, for everybody, right? Except maybe the TV and billboard attorneys who weren't going to get these cases. It had value prop for the consumer, for sure. It had value prop for the insurance carrier. But the, um, the frontline adjusters uh, weren't using it often enough. Mm. And there was too much friction with the frontline adjusters. And the management uh, either couldn't find a way to get them to play ball or, or this wasn't important enough for them to push on them to play ball. So for those reasons, we decided to, to pack it up. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Brian. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget where we were at there, uh, but the arbitrator is doing this virtually, I think is where we're left off. And thank you for the questions. Keep them coming, folks. It's quiet over there on Facebook, but I see you watching. So get your questions in. Uh, all of these are done remotely. How did that, how did that help? Did, did COVID help your business at all? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, people are a lot, obviously a lot more comfortable doing everything remotely. We're more in people's consideration set. I think, uh, you know, especially with the higher dollar claims, people wouldn't have felt comfortable with the concept of handling higher dollar claims uh, online, but now everybody is because they've experienced it. Uh, also, I think I would say the, even the bigger driver is that a lot of lawyers want to work from home or have that option. Now that they have gotten used to not having to commute or not having to drive in for litigation or, or mediation or arbitration, they, they realize they don't want to fight traffic and they want to be able to go to their vacation home or travel and work, work and, and combine work and fun. And, um, so that's a big thing is lawyers themselves wanting to be remote. And then also uh, just trying it out and then seeing that they get results that their, their team functions just fine remotely for the most part, that they can interview, they can, they can handle depositions just fine remotely for the most part, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, examine witnesses and that cross-examining is even better than they thought it might be. So all the objections that existed before kind of went away. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And tell me about how an arbitrator is paid in this situation and, and what's compensation like? Yeah, so we think an important part of our model is that the arbitrator gets paid on a flat rate uh, because we don't want there to be any kind of even unconscious incentive to drag things out. Okay. We think efficiency is a really important part of what we do because it opens up the market to people who otherwise might not be able to afford resolving the dispute. So it's a big part of who we are. Yeah. And it's just the arbitrators are okay with it because they, so it's like you can make $50,000 handling one matter or $50,000 handling 20 different matters. And in a lot of ways, there's a certain class of group of arbitrators who say, I'd rather handle 20 different matters because at least it changes things up and it's interesting and right. they're good because they're, they're helping more people resolve more disputes, you know? Yeah. So is that, uh, is that a, uh, a flat rate uh, applicable to the same rate for all arbitrators or is it depending on, dependent on case or how does that work? Yeah, we pay the same flat rate for, for all arbitrators. Okay. And what is that for, uh, can you share that information or is that something you? Sure. 
Sure. Well, it depends on the dollar amount of the case. So of the case, okay. It starts at one hundred and forty dollars flat rate. Okay. And then goes up to a few thousand dollars flat rate for most cases, and then up from there. But it's always uh, predictable, transparent, and uh, and they, you know, surprisingly, the arbitrators will will work those small claims cases for one hundred and forty dollars. Uh, because, and it takes them maybe an hour to an hour and a half each one because they enjoy it because it's, um, supplemental income and because they're able to help people, Yeah, you know, and it's also experience towards, uh, towards doing other kinds of dispute resolution for them. That's great. That's great. Uh, Mitch says he's been approached. And if you don't know Mitch Jackson, I do think he's somebody you want to get to know. Uh, he says he's been approached to do a judge action, action, Jackson, internet type of judge Judy show. So he's kind of thinking out loud here, uh, about how fair claims might be a sponsor or how you guys can work together on this show. So, uh, definitely, uh, after the show, I will tell you how to reach, uh, reach out and, and find Mitch. He's a great guy to know. That's cool. Mitch. Yeah. Let's connect. Uh, obviously judge Judy was like one of the number one shows on television and we, uh, yeah, we see merit in that. Let's talk. Yeah. And you guys are both uh, down in Southern California. Um, so we've got, we're about 30 minutes in. Uh, I don't want to keep you all night, but we go about say 40, 45 minutes. How many, can you tell us how many cases you've, uh, you've resolved or, or, or a ballpark of how many uh, matters you've resolved through fair claims? Yeah. Thousands of them, about 10,000. Wow. And tell us about the distribution. Is it, is it like everything legal, California, New York, New Jersey are the biggest uh, users or you finding some interesting uh, geographic uh, data through your, uh, through your system? Well, that's a good question. It's pretty evenly distributed. You know, is it's, it? kind of, it's kind of what you would expect. Yeah. Yeah. What we see is that um, about half a percent of every business transaction ends in some sort of conflict. Okay. And of, of that half a percent, about 20% of those can't be resolved with, with traditional communication and, and settlement attempts. And that's, that's the percentage that ends up in arbitration with us. Um, you know, and it's, there are, there are some, I think it's mainly psychographic that those are the main factors that drive it. It's like, there are certain people who are more prone to get into disputes than others, I think. Right. Uh, I, I believe that's true. I, yeah. Some people have more confrontational nature. Or, right. Yeah, I do. I, I would uh, I would see that as being true. Uh, so so, you know, based on on popular, it's, it's not distributed uh, like we see in other litigation uh, by popular, the more populous states or, or is that? No, it right. follows that. Yeah, it does. OK. All right. Yeah. And normally, so if I'm just uh user uh nick uh i'm paying that 140 for my small claims is that is that right ah good question uh you could you could okay. the, but actually the the marketplaces pay for the service because it saves them staff time it also helps mitigate social media backlash because people just want to feel heard right they need to resolve this matter somehow but the, the two can't get the resolution so um it saves them on liability there's all sorts of benefits uh, so they actually pay for it. So they pay for it. So, uh, but if I'm just, you know, I got a deal going on with my tenant and I just want to get it handled. It's over 500 bucks. I don't want to, I don't want to fight it out. Maybe I suggest to them, let's go to use fair claims and arbitrate this thing. And, and then I would, I would pay the fee in that case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anybody could sign up and pay for it. That's exactly right. And we handle those matters too. And, um, yeah, our rack rate. We we recommend for any matter over a thousand dollars because our rack rate is four seventy five. What's um, the rack rate? Tell tell me what that means. Well, just our yeah, our fee per arbitration is four hundred seventy five dollars. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so so you recommend that it you know if if you get a three hundred dollar dispute, maybe maybe yeah. don't come and use you. Yeah, yeah, maybe just don't talk to that person again. <laughs> right, right. But small claims, you know, small claims can be over. In that case, you'd say go to the small claims court, maybe, huh? In, in that situation, if they're really battling over that. 
Yeah, you you know most I think most people end up doing that. You could you could get back the arbitration fee if the arbitrator awards it. So you could try it, but it's a little bit of a risk. You know, it's a risk. Yeah, uh, which is uh, often a common issue. Uh, I tell people uh, for litigation, like uh, if I'm if somebody somebody better do me wrong in the uh, well into the six digits or I'm not spending the money to go after them because then you're just throwing good money after bad. And that's exactly the problem we try to solve to make, to bring that, bend that curve down a little bit. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, What has your feedback been from users who have used the, uh, uh, used the system or have, have you had, I'm really glad that this worked for me. Uh, or I, I can't believe that I used this and got rid of my right to take these people to trial. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you've had a little of both, but how how is the feedback been? <laughs> well, it depends if they win or lose. Right, right. <laughs> right. So we have had some people who have lost and have said, you know what? It's fair and square. I lost. Thank you. Most people aren't that angelic, right? Right. <laughs> Especially if if they're if it's gotten to the bitter stage it has, and they've been sent to us, right? When it when it ends up with us, they both think they're right. So they, if they lose, then they think that we're wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. But but that's not that's only true with uh, some some people who go through our platform. I think most people who go through the platform accept it, right? Because they're 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 bought in, and actually most people who go through us voluntarily sign up. So they're, they're usually bought in and they usually respect that the arbitrator is right, even if they disagree with it. But from the ones who don't feel that way, we definitely hear from them. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's rough. So, you know, yeah. there's some sour grapes. It's kind of a mix. Yeah, it's a mix. And, and, and that's that's a difficult thing about dealing with uh, legal issues. Right. If, if, yeah. if somebody's hurt, they're still going to be hurt, even if they even if they've uh, been determined to be at fault or. Uh, what about, uh, the user experience for, do you ever hear back from those who win and just tell you straight user experience, just straight techno technological experience. I, I felt comfortable with those things rather than the, the, those who are still hurt by the outcome. We have a great product team. Most people have a, an excellent, uh, straight up user experience. Okay. Uh, So sure. We get, we get feedback, uh, from people though. I mean, and we've we've done our best to incorporate that feedback over the years. You know, so for example, we started off doing video. People didn't love that. It wasn't just that they didn't want to be seen, but they were nervous about being able to get onto video, at least pre-COVID. Um, you know, there's other examples like that of, uh, you know, like uploading evidence is tricky because Dropbox has mastered that, but it's actually hard to get that technically right in a platform that people have given us feedback about you know, how it'd be easier to upload evidence or to download evidence. So we have a fix coming out soon on that, actually, things like that. But, but overall, they've, they've all mainly said that they've had a nice experience. It was easy, especially if they've been a small claims court, then they really love us. Yeah. That, that feels like that's an easy, that's a easy solution that you offer. If you've been to small claims court yeah, and discovered the amount of time and effort that you have to in forms that you have to fill out, doing a uh, easy digital solution to this feels like a, a, a real upgrade, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And and I think most people like feeling heard and we we do a good job of that. The arbitrators do a good job of that. They get at least a half hour hearing. Small claims court, you might get five or 10 minutes. And we have a lot of repeat users, even when people lose and even when they lose and then they get mad at us and they complain and, they, um, and even write like a public review about it, they'll come back. <laughs> so- Kind of interesting. That is an interesting spot to find yourself in as as a company who needs reviews, uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and people are. I'm I'm dissatisfied enough to leave a review, but I am coming back. But we're proud of the fact that we get for every for every one star review we get, we get two five star reviews. Okay, that's so good. We're, we're proud of that, but uh, but yeah, it's what it is. You know, it's the nature of the beast. It is. It is definitely the nature of this beast. Uh, I don't know if our courthouses can be reviewed on Google, but I well, would have looked it, it, and is they do it worse than us? I bet they do. Well, we, and we look at all the, all the, uh, traditional arbitration companies. They do worse than us. Okay. Much worse. Yeah. 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 The courts do much, much worse because they don't really pay attention to customer service, right? Nope. 
yeah, you try calling them. They're like, whatever. We're not going to help you because they don't have the resources. And you know what? I, I, they're overrun. That's why there has to be some other solution. There's got to be another solution. This yeah. is the access to justice issue. Yeah. Uh, or or a, a part of the access to justice issue. They're overrun and we need other solutions. Mitch asks, what's your favorite success story from your service? Or maybe as a even I, I normally ask this at the end is a, a, maybe your favorite success story as a founder. Well, my favorite success story of the service is a, a woman who's from a small town in the Midwest who um, who I spoke to on the phone a couple of years ago who said that she hired a contractor to upgrade uh, her property. Uh, I forget exactly what it was. And uh, her friend in the same small town happened to hire the same contractor to also do work on her home. And she hired us, the, the woman I spoke to hired us through one of the marketplaces, and she eventually had a dispute with that contractor, used us, got her money back. Her friend didn't go through the marketplace, uh, couldn't use us, never got her money back, at least when I talked to her, didn't. And that woman said, you know, um, that she would have felt intimidated to go to her local court, that she feels that the, the cards are stacked against people like her. Um, that she didn't feel she would have gotten a fair hearing. She used us, felt it was fair, got her money back. That was, that was beautiful. That was like exactly what we want to do for people, right? Is like give them justice and fairness. So that, that I think was one of the best success stories of, of the platform, you know, or go ahead. Yeah. And I think that's almost a perfect AB test of using our service versus not using our service, right? Yeah. And the person didn't go through the same marketplace that yours did. So there's almost by doing that, she opted out of finding a, a, a solution. That's uh, that's really interesting. And uh, Mitch had also asked maybe the most unexpected outcome that you've had, if you if you can think of one like that. That's interesting. Oh, you know, one time, you know, this this. We, we work really hard to make sure we get everything perfectly right the first time, right? Uh, and um, especially with what we do, since it's arbitration, there's no appeal, it's, it's in, you know, binding. There was one incident on the platform, I could get into the details of why. Um, it was, a, it was, a, it was user, a user error driven incident but now, but we wish we would have caught it. We didn't. Mm -hmm. That there were two submissions on one legal matter at the same time. So there were two arbitrations held on one legal matter at the same time, and uh, two different arbitrators made two different rulings, and uh, they were not the same ruling. And I mean, if you're a lawyer, if you've been <laughs> to court, you know that ten judges might have ten different thoughts on things, right? Uh, and so it was not the same exact ruling. And so we were like, oh man, what are we going to do? So we said, well, here's what we'll offer to do. We'll, we'll offer a three arbitrator panel. we had never done that before. The, this is the fair claims version of an appeals court, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We're like, if you both agree to be reheard again by this three arbitrator panel, you know, that'll be the final word. I, I didn't expect that they both agree to sign up, but they both did. They both did. And then the, uh, and then that settled everything. So that was good. That's perfect. Now, I'm imagining uh, that you've found a way to to track this. So yeah. uh, so if somebody signs up with a different email or something like that, uh, is there a way to track that now? Yeah, this was early on. And so yeah. I'd say within about two days after that, we fixed it, right? It's part <laughs> of being a startup. But yeah. Right, right. And we, we always, and whatever has ever come up, we always figure out a way to fix it in, in some fashion, right? Yeah. yeah, that's the customer service aspect of it. That's great. Uh, anything we, we're about 45 minutes in, Stephen, anything we haven't covered that you think needs to be covered? What we didn't talk about fair claims uh, that needs to be covered? It's a good question. I think I just want to uh, emphasize that our mission is all about access to justice, right? It's entire, and I think that's been implicit, but it's entirely what we're about. And yeah. so, you know, I, our goal is if you bring down the cost of, of dispute resolution, litigation, in quotes, then you can help people who otherwise can't help themselves. And not only that, if you make the experience user friendly so they don't need an attorney, which most of our users don't have an attorney, they're, mm -hmm. they're allowed to, uh, more and more some of them do. 
especially business owners, but the fact that you don't have to is a major deal and that should apply to any dollar amount of any uh, dispute, right? And there needs to be much more of that in the courts and outside of the courts. So that's like uh, what we eat, breathe and sleep. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think uh, many of us in the legal technology space uh, agree with that and, and find that technology is uh, a tool that should be used for uh, greater access to, to justice. Uh, it's the only way we can scale uh, the problem that the, the justice gap that we're seeing in our country. Um, Brian, where do, I'm sorry, Stephen, where do people, I'm, I'm looking, we've got Brian and, uh, uh, and Mike, thank you for being here. Bashir, thank you for being here. Uh, oh, let's see, we got a question, one more from Mitch, it looks like, do you offer uh, complimentary services for indigent or, or social cause claimants, uh, people, is there a code for that? There's no, there's no code for it. We, we do though. Um, so first of all, um, under the regs, we definitely don't charge for anything but the arbitrator fee if people are below a certain income. And then we also typically will waive the entire fee um, if it's that kind of situation. So they just have to reach out to us and it's kind okay. of a case by case determination. But yeah, we do a lot of that through the Better Business Bureau and we, we yeah, we want to help a lot of people if we can. That's great. That's great. And so where do people find you online? Twitter is a good place. Stephen L. Kane. Stephen with a PH. Stephen with a PH, L. Kane, and also at Fair Claims, correct? Yeah, yeah that's right. And the website is fairclaims.com. Yeah. And if they want to get in touch with you, uh, is there is it an info at fairclaims.com or no, uh, there's a help at fairclaims.com. Uh, link, I'm also, you know, LinkedIn's also a great way to get in touch. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mitch. Uh, thank you, Bashir. Uh, uh, both said uh, great discussion and thank you. So, Stephen, thank you. Don't disappear when we stop recording. I'll give you some follow up on uh, what to expect afterwards. Thank you to our audience over in Facebook and on Zoom. Uh, we may or may not be back next week. We're working to, uh, this is getting close to the end of the season. And uh, Stephen was patient enough to get through uh, to sit out for a couple of months uh, while we were doing a, a female founder series, sure. which is all up and running. So go check those out on the website at LegalTechLive.com. Uh, we probably have three or four more episodes this year before the holidays. So stay tuned. Keep an eye on our Twitter feed for when the next one is. Stephen, thanks again for being here. Uh, I look forward to following uh, Fair Claims and seeing what you guys are up to. Great. No, thanks for having me. Appreciate My it. My pleasure. Yeah. Have a good night, all.